The people that like Fallout 3 and find enjoyment in it typically do so through exploration and the side quests, which, unlike the main plot, allow the player to make actual, meaningful choices with consequences. And I honestly don't understand how people look at that and think that doesn't feel like a Fallout game in the style of the original games. At every stage, you can solve things with skill checks if you prioritize the right skills, and if you haven't, you can search the area to find alternative ways through, you can blast your way through if you want, you can complete the whole area as a pacifist. I honestly don't know what more people want. And in addition, since these side quests were likely written by someone at Bethesda other than the lead writer, Emma, there's the chance that some of them could potentially have good writing, or at least decent writing, which unfortunately is not the case when it comes to the main plot of the game, which is why everyone hates it and avoids it on purpose. Players had to fix the beginning, the developers had to fix the end, and that leaves only a middle consisting of hollow nonsense where you shoot the bad guys until they die and collect Fallout-themed MacGuffins. It's no surprise that players who have the most fun are the ones who traipse around on their own kind of adventure, shunning the garbage experience poorly planned for their perusal, flicking on the radio and just doing whatever they like. A friend who is way smarter than me has played Fallout 3 for a very long time and still does, because they essentially just walk around, taking very little interest in the experience the world had planned for them. The best way to have fun with the game is to view the whole thing as something to take a walking tour through, purposefully carving out your own journey almost in spite of the game itself. Itself. These people aren't playing the game wrong for not focusing on the story, they're proving how wrong the game is by showing how differently the game has to be approached in order to be enjoyed. It is a story-driven action RPG in which to have fun you have to avoid the story on purpose. That being said, even though you can put off completing the main quest, you cannot avoid it. Forever, if you wish to complete the game or get to the Broken Steel post-game content, it is a chore to play the boring and linear main questline of Fallout 3, and unlike the Vault intro, you can't as easily circumvent that with mods or a save file. But there is a way to minimize the amount of main quest you have to do, by skipping past a significant portion of it right at the start. So I decided to make this video as a sort of guide to show players how they can do that, and also what the implications of skipping past much of this content may be. For whatever flaws Fallout 3 has, it is an open world game, at least for the most part. And in most cases, you can go anywhere at any time. If you've ever played Fallout 3 before, or you've ever seen spoilers such as this video you're watching right now, then you know exactly where James is, and therefore you do not have to go through all the crap to get that information the normal way. It is also very possible that you could, by chance, stumble upon James unintentionally through exploration in your very first game. I doubt this is the case with most players, but it can happen, and I'm sure it has happened to some. Now, if you're concerned about spoilers, then shut down this video now and don't watch it any further, because I'll tell you where to find James if you don't know. Just set a map marker due west of Megaton at about the very boundary of the world map, then just continue to head in that general direction. This trick of heading west from the starting point to speedrun the game may be something Bethesda copied and pasted from the original Fallout, where one of the late game locations tied to the main quest was located west of the starting point. However, unlike the original Fallout, where enemies do not scale to your level, and thus heading west early on could screw you over by random encounters which you are nowhere near prepared to deal with at that point in the game, in the case of Fallout 3, and pretty much every Bethesda game in general, the enemies very much do scale to your level. With a few notable exceptions, such as Old Only Sewers, where very powerful enemies spawn in fixed locations. But you won't run into any problems like that by heading in this direction, unless you go into Evergreen Mills or Fort Bannister, which you might run into along the way. If you do run into these places, just go around them, unless you want to clear them out. 
You certainly can, and there's a lot of loot to be had, but the Talon Company at Fort Bannister pack some serious firepower, such as missile launchers, which are very tough to survive at a low level. If you can deal with that, great. I've also dealt with it myself, but if you are in need of this guide, then odds are you probably should avoid that for now. So, just keep heading west. If you see a place called Charnel House, packed full of raiders, then you're getting close. Clear them or avoid them, and keep going southwest from there until you see this red rocket sign, not unlike the one at the start of the game in Springvale. Here, you'll find an unmarked location, which appears to be some sort of military checkpoint. Be careful, as it is guarded by a Mr. Gutsy. If you should happen to have any pulse grenades on hand, they will make dealing with him a lot easier. Either deal with him or avoid him, and keep going to the next map marker you see to the west. This should be Smith Casey's Garage, and that's where you want to go. Oftentimes, there will be patrols of Brotherhood outcasts outside, as well as some potential random encounters. As for the military checkpoint guarded by the Mr. Gutsy you just passed, my guess is this was from before the war to keep people entering the nearby vault under control and orderly. Because, yes indeed, Smith Casey's garage is actually the secret entrance to a hidden vault. The idea of vaults being hidden and disguised as unrelated structures is a trope of vaults since the original fallouts, and so it is no surprise that Bethesda copied the idea here. In Fallout 1 and 2, the entrance of Vault 15 was hidden inside a small shack, and the Los Angeles vault was hidden beneath a cathedral. Here, in the case of this vault, Vault 112, the entrance is hidden inside of a garage. It makes some sense to do this to keep unwanted attention to a minimum. There won't be much interest in an abandoned garage, so if that's all that people think it is, then odds are they'll just move on after perhaps a brief look around. It isn't obvious there is a vault hidden inside here. Even if you enter inside the garage, you could very conceivably miss the vault entrance unless you know what to look for. Anyway, James passed through here recently and yet somehow managed to avoid the mole rats and rad roaches found inside the garage. Maybe James used a stealth boy to sneak past them. Or maybe it somehow just works and we're not supposed to question it. Either way, it is up to the player to have to deal with this mess that James did not. If you have the Animal Friend perk, then the Mole Rats at least should leave you alone. But they're not too hard to deal with, with the help of Moira's Repellent Stick, if you happen to bring that along with you. In the back of the garage, just flip this switch on the wall and it will open up a secret stairs that will lead you down into the hidden Vault 112 where you will eventually find James. If you do things this way, then you will have skipped past not only one, but also most of another major quest in the main quest line. You will see that following in his footsteps has been grayed out in your quest log as if you had completed it. You don't get the XP or the other rewards if you completed it the normal way, but according to the Fallout Wiki, you will receive the achievement for completing that quest. I have not tested this, but that's what it says. You will see that entering this vault and talking to this lovely Robobrain will activate a new quest called Scientific Pursuits, which is now mostly already completed. All you have left to do with that quest is put on the Vault 112 suit given to you by the Robobrain, and then sit in the sole, unoccupied Tranquility Lounger. This will result in the completion of Scientific Pursuits and the immediate activation of the Tranquility Lane quest. However, doing it this way means you will not receive the 500 XP dump that you normally should have received if you completed this quest the way Bethesda had intended. It should hopefully give me... I thought there was going to be a big dump of XP there. Is that a big dump of XP for finishing the silo? Maybe the XP dump is the friends we made along the way. 
According to the Fallout Wiki, you will miss out on the achievement for completing the Scientific Pursuits quest, but this is only an issue if you are playing on consoles because the PC version does not even have functioning achievements anyway, even though it is something Bethesda could easily correct. Thanks, Bethesda. This, combined with the fact that players have to mod the game to get it to run on modern PCs at all, really shows the care and craftsmanship you put into your products. Anyway, you are now in a new quest called Tranquility Lane, which is a simulated reality that you, your dad, even though there should be no way for you to know this, and all the vault's inhabitants are trapped in. This is something I'll cover in its own dedicated video if I ever get around to it, but to make it brief, if you want to know how to blow through this quest as quickly as possible, just go to the abandoned house and activate the failsafe by touching these objects in this order. This will reveal a computer terminal, and on that terminal, activate the failsafe program of a Chinese communist invasion, and then you can just leave the simulation at that point. So that covers my guide on how you can find your dad in Fallout 3 by the quickest way possible, short of outright cheating with console commands, of course, but doing this means that you miss out on some XP caps, and some other rewards which you might otherwise have received if you had done it the long way as Bethesda intended. So what exactly has changed by taking this shortcut? I don't know if any other YouTuber has ever made a video on this, so I did my own original research to find out, and I made this video so that anyone who may be interested can learn from this video. To start with, I went to Colin Moriarty's saloon, as you would normally do if you went about playing the game as Bethesda intended. There is no dialogue from Colin Moriarty whatsoever regarding your father or how to find him. I also could not find any dialogue in regards to the unmarked mini-quest to retrieve the caps from Silver, so this is one thing which has changed as a result of taking this shortcut. I then stopped by Silver's house in Springvale, and she approached me and initiated conversation with me just as she is programmed to do on the first encounter. However, there is no longer any dialogue options with her about Colin Moriarty and the caps she borrowed or stole from him. If you try to pickpocket her, you will see the caps no longer exist in her inventory. However, if you kill her, then 400 caps will spawn on her corpse, just as they normally would. So, by taking the shortcut and avoiding silver, you aren't necessarily locked out of getting her caps, but in order to do so, it now requires you to kill her, and that's the only way you can get them. So this is also something that has changed. Now, as for Rivet City and Madison Lee, whom you would normally talk to in order to get the final whereabouts of James, I had not yet visited the place or anywhere close to it in this playthrough, so in order to get there in a hurry, I used the COC console command to teleport me to the cell. The wiki says there are numbers 1 through 8 for the exterior cell, and I don't know which one goes where, so I went with number 1. That teleported me underwater and stuck inside of a rock. I hate when that happens. The only way to get out without drowning is to use the TCL command, which allows you to move through objects as if you were a Kami ghost. Ghosts. Kami ghosts who don't know they're dead. I was able to get out of the water just in time to see the drawbridge extended as it normally does when you reach Rivet City. I then made a beeline for the science lab. Keep in mind, James is making his way there himself, so I had to act fast. I talked to Madison Lee, and just as with Colin Moriarty and Sarah Silver, there was no dialogue in regards to James whatsoever. But it didn't take long for James himself to arrive. 
And after having his conversation with Madison Lee, which we, the player character, are not allowed to have any part in, we can then talk to Madison Lee again, and she is now excited by James's return. I told you it would work, Madison. Now I can prove it. James, you're back. And with good news. I was right about Braun and the Gek. If we can find one, we can adapt it to work with the purifiers. I'd like to believe you, James. I really would. This is all just so... so sudden. Madison, I'm telling you, this is real. I talked to Braun himself. He confirmed it. Don't you see? This is what we've been waiting for. I... I don't know, James. So many years have passed. Is it really still worth trying? How could it not be worth improving the lives of everyone in the Wasteland? What could be a more worthy endeavor? You haven't lost any of your passion, have you, James? It's as important to me as ever, Madison. I know it's important to you, too. Let's finish it together. James, I... we don't have a Gek. I can get a small team together, but we'll need proof that it works before people believe us. I know. I was thinking about that. The lab at the facility had some old pre-war computers that we scavenged. One of them might be useful. From the last reports, there's no power at the facility. Even if one of those computers had a database, we couldn't access it. That's why we're going to head over there right now and get things up and running as best we can. You know, if it were anyone else asking me to do this, I'd have them run right out of Rivet City. And you know I wouldn't be here if I didn't think this would really work. It's time, Madison. Damn you, James. When this is all over, you owe me a drink. I'll get the team together. Thank you, Madison. It's good to be working with you again. Did you need something? And we can tell her that we told her so, even though we've never done any such thing. So, this is all just a nothing burger, but in case you were wondering, now you know. And you might also be wondering, since I've never visited Rivet City before, what would happen if James showed up and the drawbridge had not yet been extended? Would it then extend itself for him, or what would happen? In order to find the answer, I had to suffer through the long and arduous journey of following James as he fought every enemy he came upon, at first with his pistol, and then, for some reason, with his bare hands. I watched without interference as he had his ass handed to him by enemies which had no qualms about using actual weapons. Until finally, I got bored and helped him kill the enemies, just to get it over with. And this took forever. We went across basically the entire distance of the overworld map to get from Vault 112 to Rivet City. Finally, we arrived in Rivet City and... The bridge was already extended, so there's nothing interesting to say about it at all. It would have been cool if James had been stuck there, unable to enter due to the bridge being retracted or something like that, but no, just another one of many nothing burgers that make up this entire game. But there's one final piece of the puzzle. What about 3Dog and GNR? Normally, we have to go there, also, for the answer to finding James. What about Sarah Lyons and the Lyons Pride we normally encounter in Chevy Chase, on the way to GNR? In the case of Sarah, she next appears at the Citadel, after the Lone Wanderer finishes escorting Madison Lee and her retinue of beta male simps through the Taft Tunnel. I had to play ahead beyond what I intended in order to get to that point in the game. I regret to inform you all, however, that one of Madison Lee's beta male simps didn't make it. You see, while I was escorting them all through the tunnel and doing all the combat duty by myself, this imbecile wandered in front of my laser within a fraction of a second of when I pulled the trigger. I didn't want to kill him, but it happened so fast that I couldn't help it. Fortunately, 
he is completely irrelevant to everything. Like the rest of Madison Lee's simps, the sole purpose of his existence is that he helps her. I have worked for Dr. Lee for many years. She has been good to me, helped me through some difficult times. I had little purpose in my life before she helped me. So now, I help her in return. I am no scientist, but I am good with machines. But she still has the two others, and maybe she'll acquire another to replace him at some point. She sure doesn't seem terribly distraught over his death, in any case. Anyway, we finally make it to the Citadel, minus the guy that turned into an ash pile, and Madison Lee orders Elder Lions to open up over the intercom while she spins around in a circle. You might think Elder Lyons is one of the most powerful men on the East Coast, and perhaps he is, but he is nonetheless subordinate to Madison Lee. He only opens up the Citadel on her command. If you had come here early on, you would not be able to get inside other than through cheats. And once inside, and as per usual, the real main characters of the game have a conversation and discuss what is to be done next, while we, the player character, have no say in anything and are rooted to the ground and cannot move. The only thing I can move is the camera. I can spin it around like this, but I can't take a single step from this position I'm frozen in. The game treats the player pretty much the same as it treats Harold, basically, and like Harold, you'll probably want to commit James. Finally, after what seems like an eternity, the conversation between Lee and Lyons ends and we are able to move again. And now I can do what I set out to do and talk to Sarah Lyons. Amazingly, she actually introduces herself as if we haven't already met before. Which is as it should be, because in this playthrough, we really haven't met before. So I'll give the game credit for that. In the other cases I've tested so far, this was not the case. We also do not get berated by being called an idiot for blowing her ambush, because we weren't there in Chevy Chase where normally we would meet her for the first time. So now you may be wondering, if Sarah Lyons is here at the Citadel, then what the heck is going on at Chevy Chase and the GNR where we would normally have met her for the first time? Well, don't worry, I've also visited that place to see what was different, and the results were actually kinda interesting. Well, the super mutants were certainly there as you'd expect them to be, however, Sarah Lyons and the Lyons Pride were not, so this makes fighting through here exceptionally difficult, since you now have to do this completely by yourself. Initiate Jennings, who is normally found lying dead on this mattress, is now no longer there, and neither is his power armor or gear. However, energy cells are still there for some reason. Getting through this school building is extremely difficult on your own. I found it much easier to just run through, and when I got to the courtyard in front of the GNR, the super mutants from the school seemed to be hostile with the super mutants here, and both groups of super mutants fought against each other. I have no idea why. And the huge ass super mutant behemoth spawned in as usual, but with no lion's pride there to help me, this was a hopeless battle, so I just tried to make my way inside the building. According to the Fallout Wiki, the Fat Man mini nuke launcher you normally would find in this area does not spawn in when you've played things out of order like I've done here. Which, along with the absence of the Lion's Pride, makes this fight here extremely difficult if you decide to do it, but I'm sure it could be done if you want a challenge. Anyway, I eventually made my way into the GNR building where I am informed, somehow, that Three Dog was expecting me and is waiting for me upstairs. I go to talk to him, and unsurprisingly, there is no unique dialogue or anything of the sort. Also, no mention of James at all whatsoever, although Three Dog still wants me to repair the antenna on the Washington Memorial. But I refuse to play any further because at this point I'm sick of this game. 
I am slightly curious, though, what his reward would be if I did complete his GNR quest. At this point, I've obviously already found James, and he understandably committed suicide, so Three Dog can't share that information with me anymore, so what's the point of me helping him at this point? Just some XP dump? Knowing this game, that would probably be bugged out and not provide the XP anyway. If anyone would like to test that out, let me know what happens, but for my part, I'm done.